before she leaves, <coughs> um, the, you're seeing commitment right here because this whole training program has really been her vision in recognizing that everybody that's here comes from a different background. We come from different experiences, different families, many of us different regions. We have different cultural norms that we've been exposed to. We have different professional interests. We have different kinds of work experiences. And the role that you're going to have here is also different. So as we go through this together, know that this is a, uh, about learning the whole. And as we do this, while not every single element of this might feel directly relevant to what you're here to do and to contribute, try to stick with it to look for that application because it still has some transferable benefit, I think, for all of us. As you're listening, even if it doesn't feel directly relevant to what you're doing, you're a great resource for us. We get so used to this that it's possible that we may assume some knowledge. And so what might sound really familiar to me, I may be missing some things and they present gaps for you. And so we want this to be interactive to the point that if, it's, if I'm not being clear or something really is complex for some reason, just say, whoa, 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 I've got a question about that. Recognizing that today is being videotaped for other uses um, I may ask that you try to keep in mind to keep your questions loud enough so it can be recorded, and I may repeat it just to make sure that it's being picked up by the microphones. I'm going to try and not have this be terribly stilted because it's true. I don't like this arrangement at all. Uh, I'm much more accustomed to our being together in a very different space, um, and so thanks for being tolerant with what's going to feel a heck of a lot more formal um, than, than any of us would have preferred. I'm going to also have to watch myself because I tend to walk and move, and that too is not going to be particularly helpful today, and plus I'll be blinded by the light with this. So if you see it, just know and laugh. Um, it's, it's going to be an interesting experience. The other thing that I would say, um, two things as we go through this. Jackie took you through what the goals are for this training, what we hope will be some of the takeaways for you. So this afternoon, I'd like for you to also include two things. Consider that list and others that are important to you, and then send an email to Jackie and to myself explaining what you really were hoping or expecting to learn from new staff training. We want to make sure we deliver on that. So what were you really hoping would take place during new staff training for you? What do you want to take away from this at the end of the time? And then as we go through this, Jackie was very gracious in suggesting that I've done an awful lot to make all of this happen. And I've had my part, but everybody in this room and everyone that's been your predecessor is a part of what's made all of this happen, every single bit of it. And it's going to be what's necessary moving forward. It would be really a very different place if all this represented was Kathy Bayless. And that is truly not the reality. It represents hundreds of people that sat in these chairs before you. And this presents that opportunity for you to be thinking right now, where do I see being able to make a contribution. What do I think I would like to bring to the table? That's going to continue to evolve, but I want to invite you to be thinking about that right now. You're valid today, not when then, but today you have value to this organization or you wouldn't be here. So as you go through this information, try to really personalize it and ask yourself, wow, how do I see myself contributing as a team member? Not just in the role that I'm here to do, but for the whole big picture. And that will continue to sophisticate over time. But let's try to keep both of those things in mind. You don't have to wait until you graduate. You don't have to wait until you're done, finish year one. Be thinking with us now. I can see myself doing this. This is what I want to aspire to. So we'll, we'll, we'll play that together. 
my opportunity with us to start is to do something called the big picture. And it's to set a stage for why we are the way that we are today. And we're not saying it as though we think it's the only way to be. It's just to give you a context of what has gone into the evolution of campus recreational sports at Indiana University since its history began, as best as we know it. And a lot of intentionality has gone into trying to make these decisions. We don't feel like it's helpful to be arbitrary. So when we talk about terminology, when we talk about vision, when we talk about mission, when we have something called an operational excellence model, it isn't to be cute, it isn't to be trendy, it's to be relevant and to help us do the jobs that we're here to do for our students, faculty, and staff. So it comes with tremendous intentionality to help prepare us as the people who have been privileged to do these jobs on behalf of 46,000 other people. So that's this constant lens of who's the participant? Why are we here? What do we need to know about who they are, what they need, what they expect? How do we then take the tools of our trade and keep finding those best practices so that when they come in and they have that experience with us, they walk away with some degree of satisfaction. None of us need more hassle. None of us need more problems. So I'd like to invite you from the beginning to also see yourselves as opportunity brokers and problem solvers. Opportunity brokers and problem solvers. Some of this information is going to be redundant. And there's some benefit, we think, in reinforcing certain things. So if I say something you've already heard from Jackie or some other presenter says something, it's probably not a bad thing to go, that must be important. Because it's constantly, thematically, being reinforced. And it'd be interesting for you to kind of chart what you discover some of those redundancies are, where you hear repetition and reinforcement, uh, because that too can be insightful. So with that, I'm going to cue up where we are. <laughs> At least I'm going to invite Jeff to make sure it gets shown on the screen. And we're going to launch into the big picture. Anybody have questions before we start? All righty. Thanks, Jeff. Great. Okay. So, a part of what we're going to do with culture, history, and legacy is look at some of the nuances between history and legacy. History are chronological points in time that help us understand how something has changed over time and some of the key features that mark our markers of history and time. Legacy are those things that we purpose to say we want to continue, that they become a part of who we are, our identity, our raison d'etre, and things that want to be passed along from generation to generation. So we're going to spend some time looking at that. And we're going to do it through taking a, a gander at what is the vision of the organization, how do vision and mission play together, what's reflected in the values of the organization, how do we put that into language as a service statement, and then what are some of our operational excellence categories. You've seen this in the new staff training uh, information about some of the goals, but for now, we're going to look more carefully at our role within the School of Public Health, how that evolved and why we continue to stay, get a general understanding of the big picture of our program areas and our service units, a general understanding about our stewardship philosophy, which is one of those legacy pieces, and we're going to start with the operational excellence model. You have that, I think, on the front of your actual new staff training packet, and years have gone into trying to find a way to graphically portray something about this organization known as Campus Recreational Sports. 
And it's gone through a number of iterations. So again, it's not that we think this is perfect, but we're trying to find, as it were, a one-stop shop to convey something about our identity and our purpose and the way in which we try to execute how we operate. And so this is our language, this is our graphic to try to encapsulate some of that for our common benefit and to help people that are our consumers start to know something about who we are and what we're here to do on their behalf. So if you will join me in looking at these things as we go through it, and we'd particularly like for you to very quickly get to a place of knowing this is our mission, okay? So we're gonna hit each of these. So as we look at this, the first thing that we love to really zero in on is the intentionality of putting programming for the participant at the core of it all. A lot of times we make decisions sometimes for our benefit that aren't necessarily always in the benefit of the participant that we serve. And so to try to get our lens rooted right away in not us, but them. We put programming for the participant at the core of everything that we do. And then what you can quickly surmise is that everything that then builds out of that all supports what we're trying to achieve in here. So when we started to say, gosh, what do we think our purpose is the language that we chose is we connect, inform, and inspire people to lead active, healthy lifestyles. Active, healthy lifestyles. Then the vision is a little bit different. We strive to be the most comprehensive, inclusive, and progressive recreational sports program in the country. So let's spend a little bit of time trying to differentiate those two. And just for the heck of it, as you think about the word vision, and the word mission. Is there anything that comes to you as a distinction that you sense or that you understand between those two ideas? A vision statement for an organization and a mission statement for an organization. Why bother? Yeah, Grace. Mission to me is how you conduct yourself every single day and what drives every single day actions, where vision is the long-term goal that everyone in the organization is working towards. Nicely put. So the vision is that futures orientation. What is it we're all, is our aspirational target? And for us, it's we want to be the best. As Jackie said, not the best for bragging rights, but the best in terms of how relevant, how meaningful, how appropriate, how well received are we by the people that we're here to serve? What is their estimation of best? Now, as we do that, I think we've experienced over time that in pursuing best practices, in pursuing excellence, in trying to keep them at the forefront, we've evolved to a place that other people are emulating. And so there may be indeed a level of intentionality for us that says, why wouldn't we want to help our whole field? That's one of the beauties of this field that most of you have already experienced. This is a place where people collaborate. This is a place where people share. This is a place where people don't hoard information. They're excited to give it, to share it, to make it happen, to do lessons learned. Just last Friday, we hosted a state workshop planning retreat. And it's about professionals coming together to say, what do we feel like our fellow practitioners in the state who do this at other institutions need for their retooling, for their professional development, so that we all go back from this swap shop, from this time of learning and sharing, and we're able to be positioned to do something better for the folks that we're here to serve. That's what's important to us every day. That's why your position, your experience, your aspirations play into this in such an important way for us. We want you to be critical thinkers. We want you to be looking for the gaps. We want you to recognize the things that we're doing and that we're doing well so that we keep embracing them. That's a part of striving to be the most comprehensive, inclusive, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> and progressive recreational sports program in the country. 
I want to tease the vision statement out just a little bit. You hear those words, comprehensive, inclusive, and progressive. Why would we choose words like that? What do you think? Let's start first with comprehensive. Comprehensive and progressive and inclusive, they, they could feel somewhat similar, but they really do have some different purpose for us. Yeah, Jim? We have to be comprehensive because we could literally have 40,000 members come through our doors and to offer as many programs to make them feel as comfortable as possible coming in. That's right. And so if we're comprehensive, and the focus on that is very much, we've got to provide something for everyone. Because what Jim likes and what I like and what Esther likes and what Ben likes, right, could be very, very different. So if we're here to serve that many people, then a comprehensive way of going about designing and delivering programs and services is really important. Not everybody wants to be in a structured tournament. People like doing their own thing. Not everybody needs a personal trainer. Some people we probably should try to encourage to do that, <laughs> that we see could benefit from it. And so we need to try to find a program format and a design and a variety of things, not just to attract people, but also to retain them. Perhaps if you think about your own interest, at some point, do you try to keep variety in what you do? Do you keep going to the same restaurant over and over and over and over and over and over? I mean, we've got favorites, right? And we've got defaults, but boy, it's nice to be able to try something new. So as we're comprehensive, how does that feed into those other words of inclusive and progressive? What's inclusive mean to you? Yeah, Katie. Thank you. Yes, it is about being able to see yourself where you go. And we know that for some of our students, male and female, the word is intimidation. The facility itself, either WIC and the SRSC, visually can look physically intimidating. You walk into the tennis center and you see a lot of people who are really skilled playing tennis and that can be off-putting. So even the environment, the lighting, the smells, the temperature, <laughs> all have something to do with whether they feel like, I can see myself here. The people that we use, the way that they're greeted or ignored, all of those things, not just what they see on our menu, but the whole experience creates a mindset, an aura, an atmosphere of being a place that you feel like, sure, I want to come in here and see what's available, or eh, not so much, I don't think so, and we're going to see that theme on and on and on. Why would we care about progressive? Yes, Sharice. That's right. So why keep doing the same old thing if the life cycle of that event tells us it's not being particularly well received anymore? What are some examples of new things out there that have just burst on the scene in the last couple of years? Yeah. American Ninja. American Ninja, who knew, right? And so that's kind of spawned an increased interest in fight clubs, mixed martial arts, I'm not saying all of these are good, but that's an example of the way things move and change. What else comes to your mind? Yeah. Zumba. Zumba. Absolutely. Give me some other ideas that are fairly new. Yeah. Yoga and, Yoga and Pilates. Even though they've been around for centuries in American culture, 39% increase in the last couple of years. Yeah, CrossFit. Esther. CrossFit. Another one? You had an idea? Quidditch, who knew? Harry, thank you. <laughs> yeah, Nick. <coughs> bubble soccer. And it isn't that we don't know that bubble soccer is hot. We just aren't going there because the product's unreliable. 
and people are really frustrated because those bubbles are bursting. And we don't want that to be a bubble burst experience here. But yeah, we were on that two years ago. And so yeah, staying progressive. You know, I'm getting older. Every day we all are. And it's so important to have all of you here that come from a different generation because you're so much more in tune and you help keep things fresh. You keep seeing things in it through a different lens. I, who would have guessed Battleship? You know, but we hear from the people that come and do Battleship that for them, that was the first thing that brought them into their experience with us. And I love those stories. Another theme that's a part of a history that's really, really important. The person that we consider an athlete is going to take care of herself or himself. They are already into it. They love it. It's a part of their lifestyle. But if we look back at that mission statement and the vision, the connect, inform, inspire, the comprehensive, inclusive, progressive. That means everybody matters. And that means especially, my personal and professional opinion, especially the individuals that have been marginalized, that have been ridiculed, that have felt, I don't belong, I don't have the certain body type, I don't have the certain apparel, I don't have a certain interest, I don't have a certain skill, and so I really don't see that I belong. And personally and professionally, I believe that's why we're here. I guess I can accept that of the 46,000 and so students and 7,800 faculty and staff, there are going to be people who legitimately will not do anything with us no matter what we do. I just don't want it to be because they didn't know and we didn't care and we didn't try to find a way to connect with them and to deliver an opportunity that they would be willing to give it a shot. So as we go through this, we're going to have jobs to do that sustain everything that we already are, and that's demanding. I know it. I know it. But I invite you to join me in making a part of your mission, finding out where we still have a gap and where we have an opportunity to bring somebody in and their testimony may be the one that you made possible because they said, because of X factor, I finally tried it and guess what? Now, just like some of you shared earlier, not only was that a great personal experience for you, it was a life-changing experience that's impacting some of your career choice. And everybody that's in this field has had some kind of experience like that, where they found a place to belong, they found a place that was exactly what they were looking for, and they realized, I want to make that happen for somebody else. And that has been a huge driver for me that I'll talk a little bit about when we get to history. So, when you think about the vision, what we've done is then we've enumerated some additional ways that we believe we can help strive toward that vision by providing diverse sport and fitness opportunities, doing everything that we can to advance a culture of wellness, culture of wellness, we'll chat a little about that, offering these student development opportunities. We were careful with this word. We have distinctive facilities and equipment. We shied away from quality because we know there's um, that's a, that's a tough thing to achieve, a certain standard of quality. But we do recognize the incredible importance of having the very best in the facilities and equipment that we can possibly muster. This is also really important, an enhanced sense of community. There are different ways that we structure what we do. I'm just going to give one quick illustration. Not that it's, it's been particularly successful for everyone, but you know you can bike ride on your own, right? You know that you can join a club, a cycling club. We also do a group exercise session that's called Cycle Fit. And all of those provide a different type of experience for the individual. 
And we choose to do that so that we also not only deliver on the interest the person has, but we bring people into opportunities to be a part of community. That is so very important. And again, personally and professionally, I believe increasingly important. So important that not only is it the way that we design and deliver things to bring people into community, into face-to-face -face connection, as well as do your own thing, but it also has shaped how we understand it's critical for us to be as these providers, and that's relational. That's intentionally connecting with people face-to-face, eye-to-eye, spirit-to-spirit, touch-to-touch, in appropriate ways, obviously. But you know, and we will talk about this a lot tomorrow, how many of you can say that you are absolutely elated with the level of customer service that you receive when you go out into a store, into a business, into a restaurant? How many of you can say you're thrilled? Pretty telling. I want people thrilled in their own way with their encounter with us. And it is incumbent upon us in every way. It's on everybody's shoulders for that to be a part of the experience. And we'll look at the ways that that happens. It doesn't have to be profound. We have a Just Say Hey campaign that our Student Recreational Sports Association started that we'll talk a little bit about that's try to help us. Don't forget to stay connected relationally. So let's get ourselves tooled up to do that and do that really well. And then we believe that an important part of this is to give something back to our field, is to take our best practices, our lessons learned, and feed it back into the system so that we're all elevated. We have certainly been beneficiaries of that by the things that we have done, by going out and learning from other people and bringing those things back here, and we in turn want to be a part of that history as well. But now to come back up to the mission statement, why do you think we chose connect, inform, and inspire people to lead active, healthy lifestyles? So if vision is what we're striving toward and mission is our purpose for here and now, what do those three words say to you? What do you think about that? And I really do mean it. I'm not looking for compliments. I really want to know, what do you think about a mission statement like that? Yeah. We want to connect with the individuals that we're serving here. Yep. And if we can't connect with them, then how do we know? Yeah. Informing them what we have available to them so that they know, oh, I didn't know that you offered mm -hmm. that. I would really be interested in checking it out. And just by um, the way you present yourself, you're excited to be here. You're excited to um, let people know that this is a place that we want to be. Just allows more and more It multiplies itself. Yeah, Katie. Um, I think of the enhanced sense of community aspect. It's, that's what comes out to me because they always say it takes a village to raise a child. And I, I always say when I grow up, like I, when I'm a big girl, like, and I still feel like I'm learning. So like these things, it's like this village is helping to raise me, helping me develop me, which is coming back to some more of those good pieces. Exactly. Exactly. What else? Yeah. Thank you. Um, we tend to default to what we know, to what our comfort zone is, what's familiar to us, and what's been a part of our experience. And when you're thinking about 46,000 people and the different age range of even our student population, much less to throw in the staff and faculty and guests that come through our doors, the world <laughs> is literally at our feet. The increase in the international student population here is not a trivial one. And I'll never forget in one of our sneak peeks, a woman from Russia 
came up and asked to understand how to play tennis here. And in that brief encounter, I realized how confusing we could be to say, well, we've got tennis courts, about 58 at the time, scattered around on the campus, um, but you know, some of those are at different hours that they're available. Some of them you have to get a reservation, and some of them you can just show up. Oh, and by the way, we also have a tennis club. Well, that was a very foreign concept to this individual. What do you mean tennis club? I could join a tennis club, but then how, what's the difference between your tennis club and the tennis center that I could also join to have a membership to play indoors? And all of a sudden I realized this was not just a simple question. What if I don't have equipment? Well, where do you go to get equipment? So it started revealing to us that things that we took for granted about, oh, just get on our website and put tennis in there, ends up being, for some people, very confusing. And so trying to think about connect is not assuming that we automatically know what that person is here for, because if you don't connect and try to figure out some of that, we're not going to be as effective to then know how to inform and then by giving reliable information that truly is helpful, for some people that is really going to be inspiring, just that simple. Because often people don't follow through. And we'll talk more about that in relational service. So again, that level of intentionality, and for me again personally, this revolutionized my whole attitude toward this field. And I'm going to jump to the history now because it suits the purpose. So, growing up, I was very, very active, much to the chagrin of my father, because I grew up in the 50s. And physical activity, especially rigorous, vigorous, tomboy physical activity, at that time for women, was not necessarily widely embraced. Okay? My dad would have much preferred that I be in figure skating than out playing tackle football and playing with women in college in basketball as a middle schooler. But that was just the way I was wired and it was really important for me to really get into competitive sport. But all through growing up, I started seeing how much attention went to people like me and how many people were left out. I didn't know what to call it, didn't know what to do about it, but it really bugged me. And so lo and behold, I found this field and realized that it was about making those connections for people. It was about giving others a chance to figure out how to be in love with using their bodies and that there didn't have to be a certain model for that, for it to count. And so that is such the driver. But when I first started, I was with people who at the time were fixated on knowing, and some of you will relate to this. Ben, I started out my first job, there were two. I started out as an official, an undergrad, and then um, when I came here for graduate school, I worked in the strength and conditioning rooms over in Wildermuth. And you're gonna see what deplorable conditions those were then. If you think it's hot there now, um, imagine no ventilation. No air conditioning of any type, and six-hour shifts. Yeah. So, starting out as an official, and then starting out in my professional field here, in intramural sports, the people with whom I worked at that time spent all of their time talking about officials' mechanics and how to seed people in tournament structures. And they knew the page, the article, verbatim, what the rules were, and we need to know that. So I want to be careful. I'm not trying to give a mixed message here. We need to know the tools of our trade and the rules, the regulations, and the structure for programming, all of it. Group exercise, it doesn't matter what it is, personal training formats, tennis lessons, all of it. The question for me that wasn't being answered yet was, difference does it make? So what if you know it? But how are you using it? And why are you choosing to use it? 
So if you're saying we're going to play basketball in a single elimination tournament, are you doing that because it's the most convenient and expedient way to get through to a champion? Or is there something about using that instead of a round robin that you're trying to achieve? Those questions weren't being asked, at least not where I heard them. And so until my predecessor introduced me to this idea of student development, a philosophy of seeing the sport and the fitness environment as a laboratory, which was a non-traditional classroom, where we literally could have an impact on the individual's experience by the decisions that we were making, good, bad, and ugly, whoa. That totally changed the trajectory of my life. And I thought after two years I'd made this awful, awful mistake to get involved in campus recreational sports until that connection was made for me. And then becoming a student of student development philosophy and then working with other practitioners to figure out how to translate that into how we do our business, to change the experience of the participant, to help the person who was the employee grow and develop as they were an employee, and to do the same thing with our volunteers and our student leaders. And that became incredibly a part of our drivenness to connect, inform, and inspire. Now, when we get to the section on development, I'm not saying that we can guarantee that everybody that comes to us is going to walk away going, oh, I just got a transferable life skill. Oh, I just have a life lesson from playing pickup basketball. But we do an awful lot to enhance the opportunity for that to take place by the choices that we make in how we design and deliver what we do. And that's the invitation to become a person as a professional that really starts to understand this age group, what they're all about, and how to take the tools that you're going to be acquiring and use them to, do, to impact growth and development. So that's why those words become really important to us, okay? Any comments, any questions about vision or mission at this point? All righty. The other features then that you're going to see um, is this next ring, if you'll look at your diagram, are the current program areas that actually are the ones that design and deliver the experience to our end user. Then the, this level are all of our service units that Jackie helped share the importance of what they do to support the programming goals of the organization so that we don't have to wear all of those hats and we take advantage of the expertise that others bring to us. Then what we discovered is that it's one thing to say it and it's another to then ask yourself, okay, so how do I know if I'm making any progress? And so we realized that we needed to look at these two rings, and these are our categories of excellence that we try to pursue as an organization. Risk management, participant development, personnel, all of our service areas, and relational service. So if those are our categories of excellence, what are the components within those categories that tend to typify or describe or identify what goes into risk management? And that's what this layer is here. Then this layer is the tools that we use, the mechanisms, the job aids, the data, the analytics that help us try to dis discern to what extent we're pursuing excellence in each of those categories. So you're going to get an exposure to much of this as we go through new staff training. Is it 100% done? Never. So again, you're going to have so much opportunity to scrutinize all of these things and to help us find ways to do it better. So that's that invitation for you, okay? So this will take a little bit of time to look at. You're gonna probably have some more questions so that when you get into each of these topical areas, you're gonna be able to do some more drill down with the presenters. Okay, so we've talked about that, talked about that, did the mission, values and service statements. Someone read for me, excuse me, 
what the value statement says. On the diagram, please. And read it loud so it's captured. Uh, we commit to acting with fairness, honesty, and respect, fostering individual responsibility, pursuing learning and improvement, embracing diversity, working collaboratively, and striving for excellence in all we do. Again, interesting words. The value statement was intended to help us think through together something of the character of the organization. Not the how to or the why or the what. Well, it is the how. It's mostly how do we want to work together? How do we want to function internally? What are the values that we want to characterize who we are, what we do, and how we do our business together? Then the service statement is intended to be a statement to those we serve about what we want them to also get from us. So who's willing to read the service statement, please? Yeah, Stephanie. We commit to exceeding expectations by exhibiting presence in a professional manner, proactive engagement with our participants, policy education in a respectful and informative way, and problem solving with the participants' needs foremost in mind. Absolutely. So from that statement has evolved something that we call our four Ps, right? So presence, problem solving, proactive engagement, positive education. We'll talk more about that tomorrow when we go through our relational service content, but the four Ps are something that are foundational now for us and something that will re be reflected in, it should be at least, so again, another opportunity for scrutiny, the way in which we go about also training all of our temporary employees in the four P's. So what does presence look like on the field or on the court or at the turnstiles or at tennis or on deck at the outdoor pool? What does it mean in your specific job as a lifeguard to be a problem solver? To have to know the policies and procedures so that you positively not legalistically, mechanically, in Nazi-like fashion, enforce <laughs> policies, but inform and educate in a positive fashion. That you know what proactive intervention looks like and what proactive behavior and body language and presence look like by position. And so those become important indicators to us that tie back to our mission statement. And we'll play some with those words tomorrow to make sure we're making the connections across the board. Because these are all very interdependent ideas if you'll commit your mind to thinking about it that way. They're not standalone. They complement each other, they augment each other, they reinforce each other. And so these statements become really important to us collectively. Similarly, the team model means something here. We purposefully take an inverted approach to this because that's how we see what we do. We don't see ourselves as the bosses dictating from the top down. We see our responsibility as supporting everything that this level needs to represent. So if you've got a copy of the team model, this is a good thing to pull out for a minute. It's going to be too hard to look at from up here. But this is where all the action is, where our temporary, part-time, many hourly wage folks are and volunteers, because they're in the face-to-face -face engagement with that person that's at our core, our participant. And everything about the rest of this is intended to make this job as effective as we possibly can. Everything else is driven from here through the organization side to side to make sure that all of the bodies out here that come to us walk away with a good experience. And what we've realized is there can be some benefit by looking at relationships horizontally and vertically. So thus the color coding. So if you look vertically from left to right these represent units, 
either program or service units. Okay? And this level are the program and service directors that have a responsibility for that portion of our operation. Then each of these horizontal levels talk about the different roles that people play within a given unit. So that if you see yourself as a certain color, that means across the units, your role is somewhat similar to the peers in that color group. And we've worked very hard to try to bring as much clarity as we can to what the differentiation is between what a program or service director is supposed to do and what an assistant director is supposed to do or a coordinator or a graduate assistant or a program assistant. Not all of the nomenclature works uniformly across all the units, but you get the drift, okay? And it's so important to us that you know what's intended for you that we spend this time in combination of saying in the morning, big picture, as we spend time with you in the afternoon's drill down. And we've asked the program and service directors and the assistant directors to be attentive to what's happening in the morning and to work with you where it makes sense to bring that to relevance for what it is that you're doing in your position and to answer questions about that. Understandably, we can get role confusion. It's a large organization. For some of you, you're with us a year or two in the role that you're in. And it will take a while for you to get into the flow of what it means to be a graduate assistant, what it means to be a member services associate, what it means to be a program assistant or an assistant director. And so by the time you get more comfortable, some of you, because of your skill and your past experience, you could feel that you're outgrowing that role. For some of you, you may realize, ooh, this is a stretch that I wasn't anticipating. And so we're going to have this organic, dynamic flux. But we've done what we can to try to bring structure, definition, and clarity to what your job is, because we want you to be as comfortable and equipped and prepared as possible, because could you imagine if I were expected or Jackie were expected to do all of these jobs? It doesn't work, does it? Yeah. Even within a unit, if people don't do what we need them to do and don't understand what they're here to help do, we all suffer. And so it is really true that adage that all it takes is one bad apple, all it takes is one weak link, and there's a domino effect in the organization. So while this may seem, um, I don't know what it may feel like to you. It may feel unnecessary. I hope that won't be as you continue to have your experience with us. And where you see lack of clarity or confusion, that as a team member you will help articulate where you think there's confusion, redundancy, or a gap in how we're trying to take care of business. There's no way we can all do that on our own. And so we invite you to help us look at that carefully. So that's the extent of what I will do with the team model today. Um, other than to say, everybody's role here is important. Mine is no more important than yours. It's different. And we need everybody to do their part really, really well to be effective in fulfilling our mission and trying to strive toward our vision. To give you a macro example of the positions, I'm going to start with what we intend, again, in a summarial role for program assistance. And we've played with this model for years. So, we hope that the program assistant level will eventually be a part of a feeder system that helps folks that think they want to be in this field come out of the on the floor experience as a supervisor, lifeguard, official, instructor, personal trainer, and find out more what goes on in the office. What are the tasks, what are the logistics, what goes into the operation? Because some of us think, wow, this would be a great field to be in. 
And then we find out that when you're on the other side of the desk, there's a lot that goes into making it happen that you don't necessarily see when you're a participant. And for some of us, it can be off-putting and we go, uh-uh, this isn't at all what I thought. My daughter, case in point, she thought she wanted to be a physical therapist until she shadowed physical therapist. She had in her mind that being a physical therapist was all about these wonderful relationships with people that she was gonna be help, helpful with the therapy. And then she found out, oh my gosh, there are so many regulations, there's so much reporting, there's so much documentation. The time that I have with people isn't at all what I expected it was going to be. That was hugely insightful for her. So that's another reason we want to get people exposed early on to the field. And then for those that find, yeah, this is something that's really motivational for me. I can see the application of even my getting this paper collated correctly to go to this meeting for team captains. I can actually see the relevance of that to the end goal of having teams show up. And that's almost what we have to do is look for the meaning in every step that we have and try to see it through to the end result. What difference will this make? And it may sound silly to you, but I, I invite you to do that. And even the most trivial thing can take on a very different meaning, a very different meaning. Picking up trash is one of my favorite things to do. How many of you want to be in a place that looks trashy? that looks unkept, that is, yeah, yeah. I walk into a new place and I look for the restroom first. If I could get back into their kitchen, I would, because that tells me an awful lot about a place. So the littlest thing. Okay, so my, my invitation there is, don't think any task, any assignment is unimportant, they all are. Then at the graduate assistant level and the coordinator level, we look for people that have decided, yeah, I, I know, this is kind of what I want to do. And this is the time for being an apprentice, for being a sponge, for trying to figure out what do I do for us in a two-year period to really get as equipped as I possibly can before I go out as a professional in my first full-time job opportunity. And that's what we invest in, apprenticing, professional preparation, helping people get developed for their first real full-time job. It is impossible to do in just two years, but we bring tremendous effort to that cause. And as a graduate assistant, we expect you all to be the best representation of us in all of these places that I can't be anymore, but would love to be. And that's right where it's all happening. You see things, you hear things, you establish the connection with people, you help represent the organization, all of us, just not your unit and your program area. And boy, that's a huge investment of trust, a huge investment. So we don't want you confused about how far you go, but we've also put some parameters on that because you're not yet the full-time professional and the buck doesn't just stop right with you. There are people beyond you that are being paid differently and that have a different experience and background that are expected to do things different than you, but to help train you to be able and ready to do those things. So I've just migrated into the role of the assistant director in most of that language, that color field. We look to these folks as being the folks that run a portion of the business. So if you're an assistant director or working with an assistant director in intramural sports, if you're working with Julia in club sports, if you're working with Jeff in information technology, uh, if you are working anywhere with Jim in member services, Jim has a different responsibility. Julia has a different responsibility than a program assistant, an hourly wage employee, or a graduate assistant. We expect them to be the expert of their area of responsibility, to plan, to organize, to distribute the resources, to do the evaluations and the assessments, to be able to bring that expertise to the unit to help the unit director know how to be a great advocate 
when that unit director comes together with the team of program and service directors and Jackie and me. So it is critical that that communication be established two-way from program assistant, graduate assistant, assistant director, program service director, because we have a meeting structure that's intended to take advantage of all the experience that you're getting, the role that you're in, and making sure it's being fed into our system for good decision making, and telling our story to the people that make the decisions about who gets what resources. So there really is a rhyme and reason for why this team model has been set up the way that it is. It's to equip each of the units to be effective in meeting the needs of the people that they serve. And it's to resource them in a way to give the right distribution of responsibility so that no one position is overloaded or underutilized. But that too is going to be a dynamic and it brings me to something that I ask you to try to remember. It becomes very, very difficult to compare yourselves to each other. So I caution you. you. You will not ever really understand someone else's day to day responsibility. So be careful to not evaluate, are they working harder than me? They don't seem to be. Their hours are really different than mine. I don't see them the same time that I'm here. That's to be expected. So please be careful not to assume by what limited vantage point you see. None of us fully know until we walk in someone else's shoes. And one of the messages that we keep hearing repeatedly is from program assistants who go, I had no idea. From students that come in as graduate assistants, I really had no idea. From people that have worked at different levels who come into new levels and go, sometimes I had no idea. From Kathy Bayless who has been here 40 years and every day still says, I had no idea. So please keep that in mind because it's a part of what helps us stay healthy as a culture. That isn't to say that if you see something that you think is inappropriate, that you shouldn't raise it as a question for consideration. And Jackie will talk about what that process looks like. But for now, we try to give great consideration to that. The program and service directors are a part of a team that also wear two hats. They have a responsibility for their unit, and we expect them to be the leader for that unit, to represent the philosophy of the organization, to be a part of helping to mentor and be a part of the development of the people that they serve on the team, to be in the knickers of knowing what's going on in the programs and the services and how we're doing, to set up systems for assessment, for evaluation, for communicating problems, celebrating achievements, recognizing and enjoying all of that and sustaining the culture of the whole organization by honoring all that we are in their unit and making sure that we know the things that are going incredibly well and the things that need some problem solving and troubleshooting on our part administratively. They have to know their business so well that I can trust them to tell me those things so that I can do the job that only I can do when I go to meet with deans and chancellors and vice presidents and presidents and other representatives of the institution. So it is that critical that we bring the right people in, we train them to do their jobs, we help support you do them and do them as best as you possibly can because I'm dependent on that. And I can only be as effective as everybody is effective in the jobs that they do for the organization. So I think conceptually that makes sense. Trying to make it happen and keeping sustaining it is our, our shared challenge. Okay, associate director. I couldn't begin to do justice to the blessing that this organization has in our associate director. And it isn't just because I hired her as a student. It's because of the professionalism, it's because of the sacrificial commitment and the years of exemplary service and dedication that this person has invested in this organization that I could even be here still today. And so you have a tremendous resource available 
Uh, some of you are going to have more of an exposure to Jackie automatically, especially those of you that are um, uh, graduate assistants because of the Graduate Assistant Association. But we work hard at not being inaccessible and not being distant. Uh, and so Jackie and I both are going to care very much about the experience that you have here. We're careful to not get in the backyard of the people that have been responsible immediately for you. But if you ever encounter something that's a problem for you, and you would like some additional advice or context, our doors are always going to be open. And we're going to try to make ourselves available in appropriate ways, <coughs> but without complicating direct lines of communication and responsibility by people. And so we hope you'll, you'll grow to understand why that too is important. But Jackie is our associate director. I could walk out of here today. I really could. I could leave here today and the organization would be just fine. And it's in no small part because of the level of experience, professionalism, and expertise that she has. She has a business acumen that I simply do not have. And so we leverage it. We talk all the time about, Kath, this is probably better suited for you. Jax, this is probably better suited for you. And that has been born from the 35 years that we've known each other. And so we are really blessed to have that kind of dynamic. We also are brutally honest with each other in a professional way. And we don't hold punches, but we do it professionally because we're invested in each other in the right ways. I know that whatever she says to me, she says with the best of intentions, even when it's hard to hear. And I know that she would say the same thing. That's the kind of culture we want for everyone to experience. And it's rare to be in a place that you can be safe, where you can experiment, you can discover, you can apply yourself knowing, and I mean knowing, we're going to make missed steps. We wouldn't be able to be creative, progressive, comprehensive, inclusive if we didn't try things. So you can't function in an environment where you're afraid to try because you're afraid at the reaction of the people around you. So this culture business means a lot to us. I do not promise you that we handle it perfectly all the time. What can I, I can promise you is that it matters that much to us that we keep at it until we keep working through what needs to be resolved. And we do that with the best intentions to be respectful, to be understanding, to be gracious, to look at it from the standpoint of best intentions, not anticipating somebody's trying to take shortcuts or cut corners or not do their best. So all of that you can expect from our leadership. And that's why it's important for you to then feel that you can also model that in return to each other and to us. So we're gonna have lots of opportunities to practice that over time. But we want you to know right from the beginning that we expect us to make mistakes, to miss things. It's what we do when that happens that matters, not whether it happens or not. So the best thing you can do is help be a person that doesn't just point at it and go, oh, that just that blew up. So when I started with be a critical thinker, it isn't to be a critic, it's to use your mind in a way that's toward problem solving. It's to use your eyes in a way that starts to anticipate what's happening and takes responsibility to intervene and to try to solve things before they erode even further. That's the spirit that we hope to experience and share and cultivate together. Not the, oh, I have to hide this, I have to be afraid, I can't come clean. Too much wasted energy. So for some of us that feels um, too risky and you're gonna have to test it to see if it, it's true to you, but I'm, I'm trusting that we will get there. So Jackie, in addition to managing the service areas, big portfolio. The university no longer permits us at this time to have a marketing director. I'm not gonna go into why. So Jackie is overseeing, in the place of what we used to have as a full-time marketing director, a marketing unit as its director. We also aren't in a position yet to create a standalone unit for risk management. 
and again because of her experience and expertise that she's acquired over time, we look to her for doing that with some other staff members, some other team members. But she provides leadership for marketing and risk management as well as supervises all the service areas. On top of that, this is her professional passion as well, she loves capital facility projects. And so as a part of her job overseeing facility support with John Peterson and the service director, she also is the person that really drives our major capital projects like the recreational sports field complex. Now, a lot of other people, myself included, are helping, but her job is our master facility planning. And so there's a lot that dovetails. The only service area she does not oversee is financial affairs, and that's my area of responsibility at this point. Because I have to know what's happening and what to articulate to make sure we have what we need in that area. So it's a big job. I absolutely look to her as my everything in terms of administration, and we have this tremendous trust uh, and years of experience to call upon and a level of objectivity is unparalleled in much of my experience working with people. So I have tremendous confidence in the team that is here to serve you all in that regard, and we can often be interchangeable, which we believe is an asset to the organization. So we know how to pick up for one another. You might say, well, gosh, then, Kath, what the heck do you do? And you know, that's a fair question. Um, so in addition to overseeing the program areas, I really have a direct responsibility for the administrative relationships with people in our school, in the Dean of Students office, in the Vice Provost, with our Provost, and with our President, and with our trustees, and with our alumni. So it is still both an internal focus, but also a community and institutional relations job. And we have had so much change in our central administration in just the last five years and even more significant change on the horizon, that it's hard to explain what it takes to educate new leaders to what it is that you do. But it is not a, a small thing for us and we know how important that is. So I tend to be highly relational and I love that part. And so I like doing that on behalf of us all um, and hopefully it pays dividends and the resources that we're able to sustain. So, that's a part of that. Now, culture, history, and legacy. These are the kinds of things that go into building a culture. Every organization has one. Or let me ask, let me just ask. Well, let me go through this because we're almost ready to go to lunch. You all have been so patient. Every organization has one, whether they know it or not. But the fact that a culture exists doesn't guarantee that it's going to be positive. So we're spending time looking at what's a part of this culture so that we not only understand the history, but the legacy pieces that we all want hope that you will own and continue with us. So these are some of the things that we're gonna quickly look at. You heard a little bit about my history. You all have a personal history that's been shaped by the family you grew up in, where you grew up, what kind of school you went to, what kind of extracurricular experiences you went through, your friends that you decided to make yours, all of that. Same is true of this organization. We grew up in a school of health, physical education, and recreation at a time when all this campus knew was competitive sports. And the idea of a recreational approach to physical activity was totally foreign. So why do you care about that? Because when you look at the facilities that we have over at Wildermuth in the School of Public Health, it screams that tradition. And when you compare the differences between what you see there and what was designed here in the 80s that didn't get built until the 90s, it explains a little bit why they're not mirror images. Because society had continued to change from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. It wasn't until into the 50s that women really started coming in droves to school. And so most of the facilities on the campus were designed and built by men for men. It's not a criticism, it's a historical fact. But that historical fact has resulted in the type of spaces and the design of the spaces that we have inherited. We had a chance to change some of that with this, 
but by the time it got built, it was already outdated. When you look at the time of what has changed in our society, even since the 1980s, we don't have enough studio space, do we? We don't have the kind of workspaces that we need. We don't have the gathering spaces that we need, right? We got a lot of courts, but not a lot of nuance. Even the structural architectural design is so outdated. Everything is siloed. And today, it's all about open spaces and being able to see in places. You can't even see what's next door. <laughs> so who knows what's going to happen in the future? But all of this history says something about who we are today, why we are today, and gives us a clue about what we need to do to stay right, comprehensive, inclusive, progressive, so that we connect, inform, and inspire. Okay. So, you, you saw some of these answers this morning. Gain an insight and understanding about our purpose. Draw strength and appreciation from seeing what others have done. Maximize resources but not having to reinvent the wheel. Learn what's valued by the organization by seeing how it's grown and developed. Identify directions for future activities. History. These are the things that have gone into building our history and our legacy. When you go in the resource guide, I'm not going to do this now, you're going to see a very, very, very incomplete but concise historical statement. That's one of the things that we would like for you to do this afternoon, is research where to find this in the resource guide. And if you'll follow the bouncing ball here, check these two areas in the library, general info and resources. You're going to see a lot of helpful things right here on the left menu bar under RS general info and RS resources. But here's, here's the nutshell version. We were known as the graveyard of the Big Ten. So when I came here for graduate school in 1973, Wildermuth was a dirt floor. There were four wooden basketball courts in the middle. We literally had to take the fire hoses off the wall and spray down the floor because of all the dust on dry days. So very, very different place. There were no woodlawn fields. There was no recreational sports field complex. You're going to see some of those pictures in a minute. And the only thing that the students knew was really a very small competitive intramural program. The men's program probably had eight sports, the women's maybe four. So very, very different. We didn't have fitness, we didn't have informal sports, we really didn't have an aquatics program, and it was pretty much intramurals, and there were six club sports on campus, but they didn't report to any one place. That was 1973. Now, in society, what had happened in the 60s and what was happening in the 70s that you can think of that were huge societal movements that started impacting our business and the college campuses? Some of you weren't born, I know, but bear with me. You did some history, right? So, Civil rights. pardon? Civil rights. Civil rights was huge. Related to that, what else? No feminists in the group, and I mean that in the most positive way. The women's movement, part of the civil rights. Yeah, but we tend to think of civil rights as a race-related issue. Title IX. Anybody know what Title IX is? That's a really, really important piece of history that continues to probably not be supported to the extent that it needs today. And it's an important part of Indiana history because our former Senator Birch Bayh fell in love with a woman who was brilliant, wanted to be a lawyer, applied to the University of Virginia, and was summarily denied admittance. And the admittance letter said women need not apply. And knowing what he knew about his soon-to-be wife, Marvella, Birch partnered with some other senators and drafted Title IX legislation to eliminate discrimination based on gender in institutions that received federal funding. And that includes most institutions of higher education. So it was the first door to open women's rights on an equal status. And what no one predicted was the extent to which it was going to impact sport. So, much of the athletic world went, ah, 
because it meant that women who wanted to play in sport had equal opportunity, should be given the same opportunity as men who wanted to play athletic sports. And the trickle-down effect also impacted what was happening in recreation-related programs in the country. When I came here as a student to start my graduate work, there were no graduate assistantships for me because I was a woman. And so everything that I did was totally volunteer. Had nothing to do with whether I was capable or not. It only had to do with the fact that I was a woman interested in a sport-related career. And there were no assistantships for me because I was a woman. So we have really seen a lot of change. That has impacted the history of this campus. When I first came here, women were maybe 40% of the student population, now they're 53%. And that change has really been reflected in the programs that we design and deliver, right? So we didn't have a fitness-related group exercise program until 1979, 1980, and it was started through the Student Recreational Sports Association. So we have a very fascinating history when you juxtapose what's happened here against what's happened in the larger world environment. And that's, again, that connection that we constantly need to make. We connect, inform, and inspire based on also how we're impacted by the larger world and the impact we want to have on the larger world. So that when we start talking about connect and you start looking at the research that's being done, not all of it validated yet, but some of it emerging in credibility, the negative impact, the negative side of social media and what's happening with social isolation, depression, erosion of fundamental communication and interpersonal relation skills. What we do becomes, I think, increasingly important in not only helping people with their active, healthy lifestyles, but that enhancing community. And the history that we're a part of today is a part of what's gonna drive our professional decisions for tomorrow so that we're satisfying this next generation and the development needs that they have. So I'm hoping that brings in a circle of there's rational thought behind needing to know who we're serving, where they are in their stage of development, what they're facing as challenges that really threaten <laughs> or excite us about the next generation, and what role do we have in shaping that to maximize it in the most positive way possible. So when Ben's trying to help train an official to know how to really not just call mechanically correct and positionally correct a foul, but how to deal effectively with the reaction of the participant, that's an investment in learning. And that's the lens that we're talking about here. Not just going through the mechanics of knowing what it is, but why is that important? How do you need to be able to make that connection with that irate person and know how to respond professionally, ably, and have that be a learning opportunity? That's what all of this is founded upon and what really helps drive this to be so much more meaningful. Knowing the body of knowledge, knowing how to apply it, how to deal with a customer on the phone that's really upset. And we had one recently really upset from experience they had while being here in town for a, a tournament in the community. And it went to the president's office, it went to the board of trustees. And thankfully, one of our member services associates was a part of problem solving in a way that reflects so well on all of us. But had that person not done that, what that person did, Jenny Roach, we might have had a very different set of circumstances coming back at us from the president's office and from the board of trustees office. So all of these things play into understanding who we are today, what we need to do for tomorrow. So I invite you to read some of that. You're also gonna see in there the way in which this started to metamorphosize when we were able to build this building. So there's a, 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 a thing in there called Campus Recreational Sports Highlights, and it's related to the construction of the SRSC. We also have this in hard copy, and we also have this that's being updated now as we speak in the resource guide. If you want a one-stop shopping thing to help explain to people that really don't necessarily understand who we are and what we do, this little brochure might help. And it's an at-a-glance explanation of all of our program areas and some stats 
that might be of interest to you. So that too is in the resource guide, fast facts, kind of fun. Now, I'm gonna have to stop on this, but I'm gonna slide through some, some things. What is that? Limbo. It's kind of hard to see, but if you look at what that is, what's that look like to you? Pizza. Yeah, so what do you think this is? Pizza eating contest. Bubble gum blowing contest. Anybody have a clue what that is? That is Earth Day back in the day. Nope. It's, but it has a specific name. It's one of the new games from way back in the day. It's called a lap set. We had 315 people. If you can imagine Wildermuth, this was, these events were all in our spirit of sport all nighter, something that we did for 33 years. We started in 1975-76, because again, 1975-76, traditional intramurals, varsity mindset, professional sport mindset, nobody had a clue. I mean, I can come over and do bubblegum blowing. I can come over and do limbo. I can come over and do hula hoop. I could come over and do a lap set and actually have fun and not have to demonstrate some prowess at a free throw line. You've got to be kidding me. And yeah, no, we're not kidding you because we want to blow open your idea of what it means to be in a recreational sport environment where you really can have fun. You don't have to take yourself so seriously. And the sky's the limit on what you can do, unless it's unsafe. One caveat. So what you do is we got everybody in a line, you know, in a circle, so that they buddied up you know, like this, and on the count of three, sit. And it was an unbroken line of 315 people in Wildermuth, and it was a riot. You can see it on their faces. It was a blast. Twister, yeah. Oh, simulating white rapid rafting off the diving boards in Royer Pool Diving Well. Yeah, our canoe and kayak club trying to put together one of the largest group exercise sessions. Again, you gotta remember, 1970s. This was just really coming on the scene, and so we wanted to take advantage of that and leverage it and bring women in. So we did a lot of fun things. So we're gonna stop here because it's time to transition to lunch. Um, but we're gonna hit on each of these little areas tomorrow. I'll also touch on some financial management, big picture things, and some relational service and student development. So we'll have a lot to do together tomorrow.